So this is really the outline of my talk. I'll divide the rest of my talk in three parts. The first one will talk about what we call uh, deep uh, preconditioners. The second one will be uh, how we use blind spot networks in the framework of solving an inverse problem. And finally, we'll talk also a bit about physics informed neural networks, which I will say loosely speaking can still be seen as a self supervised approach because you're not providing any uh, input output uh, training pairs. The self supervision comes from the knowledge of the physics you put in your loss function. All right, well, thanks a lot, Alba, and everyone in the Visual Intelligence Group for inviting me, and also for everyone attending here today. It's nice to be back in Norway, at least uh, not physically, virtually. As you said, today I'll be talking about self-supervised learning in seismic data processing. It is a fairly broad uh, topic, and is a fairly broad uh, title. You'll see that I'm going to talk about a few different applications that we're working on and developing in the group. And I think that if you're not into seismic, if you're not even into geophysics, however, some of the learnings and findings that we have uh, uh, started to uh, come up with uh, may very likely have broader implications in any uh, domain where you're trying, or in any imaging discipline where you're trying to infer some parameters from observations and they are related somehow uh, via some uh, well-known physical process. But nevertheless, as we will see, you can take advantage of neural networks uh, alongside the, the way that brings you from the data to the model. So before I begin, let me say that this is not just the work of myself, it's actually a work of uh, some of my students and postdocs in CAUS, as well as I will briefly show some collaboration work that we did with uh, uh, my original group where I actually studied my bachelor and master degree back in Italy. And I would also like to thank the PyLOPS and the PyTorch development communities, which are the two main uh, Python frameworks where we use and build on top uh, to develop the methods you will see today. So when we talk about uh, deep learning and artificial intelligence, I'm not going to spend more than a minute. Everyone knows that there is no doubt in the last decade there has been some spectacular achievements, possibly that came even earlier than experts in the field that they originally forecasted. And they are in computer vision, language, gaming. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, even though possibly we are not uh, at that level yet, even in the field of geophysics and geoscience, since uh, the early 2015, possibly uh, 2016, 17, where most of the papers started to uh, come out, uh, we have seen a great uh, deal of applications where uh, tasks that initially were performed, or even today, are usually performed by experts in uh, energy companies. They can now be performed at similar speed and, sorry, at similar quality and definitely faster speed by uh, machines or automated algorithms. I just want to mention a few examples. For example, uh, seismic interpretation of horizon folds or geobodies. You can think about interpretation of uh, wireline logs or automatic detection of, uh, for example, earthquakes from a uh, very long time series. So the yes. point I'm simply making is that all these tasks that I show in the previous slide, they are all made, uh, they're all uh, possible uh, that to achieve by giving enough time to an expert to look at the data and uh, do some analysis and come up with some uh, interpretation. What machines are doing at is that they can also do it by using our data and our training uh, labels, but they can do it faster and possibly better because they never get tired. There is another uh, thing that characterizes all of these uh, tasks, in including those where uh, the real deep learning field has been uh, sort of taking uh, uh, taking everything in the computer vision and language processing by a storm is that most of these tasks are classification tasks, where you have uh, 10, uh, probably up to 100,000 labels if you're doing some uh, text analysis, but still you have a discrete uh, set of labels in which you want to uh, predict. When it comes to uh, seismic processing or geophysical processing, and similar to other domains where you want to process data, like in medical application or in non-destructive testing, the situation is slightly different because what we are after prior to uh, going into interpretative tasks is to do some transformations to our data that bring the data from a continuous domain to another continuous domain. 
Let me just make similar uh, simple examples that are uh, similarly applicable to geophysics as well as other fields. For example, one problem in geophysics referred to as seismic interpolation that uh, the deep learning community usually refers to as in painting is the problem where you have a data with some missing uh, portion of the data. In our case, will be missing traces because we have missing receivers or sources and you try to infill in between uh, these missing traces. And in this case, deep learning has been shown to be uh, quite powerful. You can also imagine problems that have a bit more physics than that. For example, de-ghosting or de-multiple, where you try to counteract the effect of the free surface when you acquire data in a marine setting. And again, there is a well-known physical process that uh, generally relates the data with and without uh, ghost and multiples. In all cases, if you look at the literature, especially the very first applications, they rely on two different uh, possible options for the training data. So first of all, they all rely on supervised learning. And since it's a supervised learning task, they rely on two possible options for the training data. One option is well-crafted uh, synthetic data and uh, with the limitations that comes with making synthetic data. The other option, especially in industry, people have started to simply say, we have very trustworthy algorithms. Let's run these algorithms on a small portion of the data. Let's then train a network to do the same. And then eventually, perhaps the network is going to be faster than the algorithm itself, and it's going to be applied to the rest of the data. What I really like of the first presentation is that the authors also went through the effort of trying to see when this paradigm breaks. And they did a very simple example where they took the data now with a different uh, time sampling. And if you are a geophysicist, you know that different time sampling means different. You are shifting or stretching and squeezing the frequency content of your data. And so if they use the network that was pre-trained on a different time steps, and uh, now the results that they obtained are not as high quality as the result they obtained where the training and the test data were fully consistent. And that tells me that uh, we have an elephant in the room here. And the elephant in the room can be, in a way, uh, represented by two uh, concurrent problems. The first one is generalization. The fact that we know in deep learning we need to rely on very good ground truth targets, and the moment we move away from the uh, domain or the distribution of our input and labels, we uh, usually run into troubles. The second is that if we use another algorithm, say a state-of-the-art industry standard algorithm, to produce the labels, then we all know that deep learning can at best be as good as the algorithm. So the game that we are playing here is can we be faster because later when the network is trained, we just go through a few convolutional layers instead of solving maybe an inverse problem, but hardly will be better. So the question is, can we be better? At least my question is, can we be better? That's what, that's what I'm, I'm mostly interested in. And to be better, I really believe that we cannot ignore the physics. We can just present the learning algorithm with some training data, obscure the physics in the training data, and expect that the network will be uh, as good as if we provided some information about the physics. So there are various ways to provide information about the physics. There is a very big uh, field in uh, applied mathematics these days called uh, learned uh, iterative solvers. That's one way to go about, but it still requires uh, supervision. So what we really started to look into a year ago is uh, the area of self-supervised learning. Can we still leverage the power of neural networks without really needing to provide them with uh, label data, so with uh, input and output uh, training pairs? And uh, some of you may be confused uh, during the talk. They may wonder why this is self-supervised and is not unsupervised. And I agree with you that uh, sometimes these terms are used in a misleading way. And I really like this quote from Jan LeCun that says, unsupervised is generally a loaded and confusing term. Self-supervised is much better when what you do, you take uh, ideas and techniques from supervised learning and you apply them in a smart way by, for example, hiding a portion of the input and asking the supervision task to learn the other portion or doing anything that does not require different input and output, but the input and output are the same uh, data sets. Uh, Self-supervised learning comes in many flavors. The two that we're going to discuss today are representation learning and uh, blind spot networks. So this is really the outline of my talk. I'll divide the rest of my talk in three parts. The first one we'll talk about what we call uh, deep uh, preconditioners. The second one will be uh, how we use blind spot networks in the framework of solving an inverse problem. 
And finally, we'll talk also a bit about physics-informed neural network, which I will say, loosely speaking, can still be seen as a self-supervised approach because you're not providing any uh, input-output uh, training pairs. The self-supervision comes from the knowledge of the physics you put in your loss function. So starting from DP conditioners, and all of this uh, presentation will be around the idea of linear inverse problems, even though you can extend it uh, to no linear ones. So I just want to briefly spend a minute or two say uh, what we usually do when we solve an inverse problems, uh, whether this is geophysics or any other imaging science. We generally have some data, why? We have an operator that uh, encapsulates our physics or the knowledge of our physics, and then we have a vector of X that we wish to know about, but we generally cannot acquire directly in the field. So what we simply do, we set up an inverse problem that tries to uh, find the best X that matches the data. The problem is that if the problem was well posed, we could just invert the operator G and we'll be all uh, happy and satisfied. But there's almost no problem in real life that is well posed. So what we tend to do, we tend to solve a least square regularized problem where we add some prior information, and this can be added in the form of either regularization or uh, preconditioning. And in most cases, for a long history of uh, inverse problems and optimization, what people did, they tried to find the best representation that either enhances some features of your model or destroys uh, some feature of your model and penalizes them. Uh, what we want to look at is a slightly different approach. There are two flavors. One was proposed in 2020 by uh, researchers in the uh, medical imaging uh, community. And the other one was proposed by myself in 2021 at the SCG conference. So in this case, what we suggest is that we could try to learn some uh, latent space representation or a, a dimensionality reduced representation of the model that we want to estimate. And then we can feed uh, these uh, neural networks. So we have two neural networks that uh, create an encoder uh, decoder pair, what we call generally as uh, autoencoder in uh, deep learning jargon. And we're going to learn this, and then we're going to use the decoder as a preconditioner instead of a, a human handcrafted one. The idea of deep regularization is actually nice and is very similar. You are, in this case, using both the encoder and the decoder and leveraging the fact that if you put something in that is very different from the manifold of the solution you have learned uh, in, the in the previous step, you will produce something that is different from X, and then you will penalize this. In both cases, the key idea is how can we learn this representation? And what I will show today is that actually for some problems, we do not need to even know anything about X or we don't need to have access to a number of uh, X uh, samples. We can really learn this directly from Y, provided the uh, way we do that, uh, we are smart about it. And we will see two examples. So first of all, how the uh, procedure works in a sort of visual sense. We have two stages, as I said. In the first stage, we take our input data. Let's imagine we have uh, some seismic data that we divide it into uh, patches. We send it to the encoder and then to the decoder, and we try to reproduce the data itself. So what we're trying to do, we're trying to learn a representation in this latent space that is representative of the manifold of solutions that we are providing the network with. Once we are ready with this, instead of solving the inverse problem directly in the model space, we're going to try to solve the problem in this uh, latent space. So we're going to invert for Z, and we're going to just combine these. Uh, let's forget about this scaling for a second. We combine it with a physical operator, and we predict the data, and we compare uh, these with the observed data. So in this way, we are not really getting rid of the physics. The physics is here, but also we are trying to use the power of neural networks as a function approximators and better function approximators than our classical uh, linear transformations. When we started, of course, the uh, first results that we achieve, and I think this is common to almost any uh, deep learning project when uh, is applied to a domain outside of uh, where the whole idea in a way started, is that the results are not as good as you as you hope. And what you see here is that if you train an autoencoder, a fairly simple uh, CNN-based autoencoder, the prediction looks quite good, but you're losing a lot of uh, fine details. And that's not very surprising because autoencoders have been used in the past as denoisers. And if you look at the error, you could claim that what you are removing uh, could be seen as noise. In my opinion, this is not noise, especially there is quite a lot of signal leakage. 
And so what we started to work on even before going to the inversion phase is how can we improve the learning while still be able to have a fairly small latent representation. And here are three key elements that through time we added. First of all, the architecture, of course, the architecture matters a lot. And here it turns out that uh, adding ResNet blocks is uh, a very good uh, sort of uh, trade off between not having something too complicated, but at the same time being more robust than a classical uh, CNN sort of, uh, un uh, sorry, autoencoder type of architecture. We also look into some of the literature of what is called the multi uh, learning uh, process. We are not really doing multi-learning here, but what we decided to do is that perhaps the network needs to know more about uh, the actual uh, data than just having losses that are element-wise. So instead of using only, uh, sorry, local type of losses like MSC or MAE, we also combine them with the semi-global losses. For example, the correlation coefficient between a trace in the input and a trace in the output. And finally, to again make the network struggle more to uh, produce a satisfactory representation and so avoiding the network to learn the identity, we added some gaps in the input that will be in a way very similar to what we're going to experience later when we feed this to one of our inverse problems. And the result that we obtain here has a much uh, reduced uh, validation error, and that means that with this input, we are now able to produce much more representative outputs and we can trust our decoder later uh, not to do uh, arm to the signal when we solve the inverse problem. So let's look now how do we solve the inverse problem. This is fairly simple. We just take, uh, if we have patch our data into patches, we just take uh, multiple uh, vectors in the latent space, we feed them to the decoder, we get patches and rescale and organize them and then we apply the physical operator. This scaling turned out to be very important because when we train a neural network, generally we want to train it in a uh, fixed dynamic range, for example, minus one to one. But when we try to apply in, uh, our inverse problems, the data needs to be in the correct scale uh, representation. So through the vector Y, we are able to find an estimate of the scaling that is robust and we apply the scaling on the fly. So this is how the inverse problem eventually looks like. We have our data, we have a chain of uh, nonlinear and linear operators, and then we have some regularization. And we can simply solve these using second order optimization algorithm like LBFGS, because in this case, we are not dealing uh, with mini batches. We are not dealing with uh, uh, training. So if we deal with a classical full gradient, we know that these second order optimization methods are very efficient. I have two examples. So the first one is an example of joint interpolation and deghosting. You can think of these as if you went out in the field, you acquire data, but you don't have the uh, acquisition a spatial sampling that you would really like to have for further processing. And also since you acquire the data in a marine setup, you have this uh, free surface playing bad to you, sending all the energy back into the subsurface, and then you have all of these uh, ringing, all these waves that come back. So the goal here, classical goal in uh, seismic processing, is to remove the ghost as well as interpolate. How do we frame the problem? Well, we simply say, let's take patches in the common receiver domain where we assume sources have a better sampling, and we can use these to learn a good representation of the data. And we don't have data without ghost. We just take the data with ghost, and you will see that uh, despite we are doing that, we are getting a very good representation. So this. Uh, takes us apart from algorithms that require to apply some pre-processing or some state-of-the-art algorithm to give us the degaussian data to then uh, train a network. The inversion part is fairly simple. We choose the operator to be a ghosting operator plus a restriction. The observation is obviously the data without the direct wave. I'll uh, not discuss this in detail why it's needed. And what we want to recover is the upgoing component. And here we're going to patch in the common shot gather because we do this interpolation shot gather by shot gather. The results that we obtain for a synthetic example is uh, shown in this slide, so it's a bit busy, but I really wanted to show how you can start from something that is not as good as state-of-the-art algorithms. I also like to remind people that in geophysics, uh, people were not stupid before deep learning and not stupid today, so we have very competitive algorithms. Beating state-of-the-art is not easy. 
And in fact, our first attempt did not beat the state of the art, which is a curve that pays a sparsity promoting inversion. On the other end, when we started adding features to the training process that I discussed, we can get to a point where we have a signal to noise ratio that is about 3 dB higher and clearly also visually uh, much higher quality. In this case, we are dealing with a fairly simple problem because we are doing irregular subsampling. We assume we have access to 30% of our traces, but we also have example with the much more complex problem of ir uh, regular subsampling. We also have a preliminary result that this was not uh, shown at the SCG conference uh, of a field data. We take a field data again. We assume that in one domain we have better sampling. We learn the representation and we compare again with two different state of the art algorithms. FK, so patch FK sparsity promoting inversion and uh, curvelet sparsity promoting inversion. And we can see that we get better results. And what I really like here is that the part of the data that has the uh, strongest dip, so the, uh, the, dip, the most difficult one to reconstruct, is reconstructed much better in our method because we are basically learning uh, through the data that there is this type of events uh, and this type of events is going to appear somewhere in the data. While in these two approaches, since you're using a, a fixed basis uh, representation, so a fixed basis uh, transformation, this is obviously uh, not provided, this information is not provided to the problem directly. A second example is uh, in this case uh, produced by collaborators at Polytechnico di Milano, has been recently submitted to IEEE. We are dealing with the problem of deblending, and I'll spend a minute here discussing what this problem is because we will do it again in the next application. Deblending is the seismic equivalent of the cocktail party problem, where you have multiple people talking on top of each other, you want to separate them. And why do we do this in seismic? Because we want to acquire data at the smallest amount of time. So we reduce the time that we are out in the field, but we don't want to reduce the amount of uh, sources that we are finding. So in this example, we are taking what is called a group uh, blending approach. We have two sources, for example, two sources uh, that are connected to two different vessels and they move together. One is firing a regular interval. The other one is firing a regular interval plus uh, some deterring which allows the uh, inversion to be possible. If you were to just acquire with the same uh, time uh, firing, you will have much uh, less uh, opportunity to deblend, as you will see in a minute. What we do here again, we do not have access to the deblending data, so we just learn from patches in the common shot domain, which you will see in the next slide. They really look like the deblended data. And when we do an inversion, the operator is the blending operator. Uh, the observation is this uh, super shot gathers that contains two shots at the time. And what we want to estimate is a vector that has twice the size because as the individual shots. So for those that are not familiar with uh, the problem of seismic uh, simultaneous shooting or deblending, this is how the data looks like in the common uh, shot gather domain. So each of these panel is one shot, actually two because they're firing together and along the X axis you have receivers. So you see clearly that you have these two uh, hyperbola followed by events. These are from the two sources and they move to the right together and they overlap. If we however look at a different direction, we look at what we call the common receiver gather. So we look at one receiver and all the sources at the same time and we apply a pre-processing step called the pseudo deblending. We are able to fix the timing of one source but all the other sources now they are showing or the data from the other sources is showing now like interference or bar burst like noise. So the intuition here is that if we train an actor to learn this representation later during the inversion when he's going to see things like this, it will naturally start to reject information that has never observed this uh, burst like noise and it will keep the coherent information. Here is a comparison between the approach using our deep uh, preconditioner strategy versus a end-to-end deblending where the authors of these previous papers uh, they created manually from synthetic data uh, blended shots uh, and uh, they basically train a network to remove the noise uh, in uh, this domain here. If we compare the results both the SNR as well as the error we see that we get much uh, smaller uh, signal leakage compared to the previous method and our intuition is obviously that uh, in the previous method, the physics was completely left behind, 
While in this case, we are solving deep blending by inversion, that is well known in industry to be nowadays sort of the standard. And uh, all we are letting the network do is helping us to do the denoising step, which as we will see soon, this could be actually more powerful than, for example, other type of uh, non uh, deep learning based denoisers. This brings me to the second topic, blind spot networks and inverse problems. The idea here is very simple. It uh, leverages a paper from 2013, a so-called plug and play regularization. This is a very uh, fascinating technique that uh, people in the mathematical community are still trying to understand why it works theoretically. And what the author suggested is that if we don't know how to choose a regularizer, let's just not choose it. Let's just say that a regularizer is a function r of x and uh, let's solve the problem or at least let's write this problem down uh, using uh, basically convex optimization type of algorithms uh, aka so-called proximal algorithms if you try to solve this problem assuming that r is convex using a proximal algorithm for example the famous admm this is what it turns out to be your problem you have to solve it as a cascade of three steps and while the first step is a classical uh, least square regularizing version that we can solve with any uh, solvers of choice, the second one, if we simply rearrange it like this, and, and you are familiar with the uh, problem of denoising, this is how you will write the denoising problem as an inverse problem. You're trying to have a vector y that matches your data, but not too much, otherwise it will match the noisy data. And the not too much is given by this uh, regularization. So the intuition here is, since we know this is a denoiser, why don't we use a denoising algorithm that has nothing to do with inverse problems, and uh, we just plug it here every time we get to this step. So there are many algorithms, of course, that do denoising. In geophysics and in computer vision, we have developed a lot of algorithms throughout the years. What we really want to focus on here is uh, deep learning algorithms because in the last couple of years they've shown to outperform state of the art uh, type of algorithms. So you could use supervised learning. There are quite a few options here, but as I said before, that's not something we really like because it will require us to model the noise in a very uh, uh, sort of uh, consistent way with what we're going to expect. So instead, we started to look into a family of uh, deep learning algorithms called self-supervised learning, uh, or more specifically, blind spot uh, learning for denoising. What these algorithms do, they create a network that is specifically crafted not to use the middle pixel to predict the middle pixel. So they're doing very similar to what you will do in standard statistical denoising. You learn from the neighbors what should be the value of the middle pixel and if the signal is more coherent of the noise, this will be successful. Uh, the algorithm was initially proposed by developers at NVIDIA in 2020. It's very uh, interesting, the idea. They simply use a UNET, but a, I would say it's a superpower UNET because it's a UNET that has uh, a causal convolutional filter, so it allows you only to use a part of the receptive field, actually the one above the uh, signal or the pixel you want to predict. And then they do some rotations because you want to predict not just from what is above the pixel, but also what is on the left, on the right, and below. So it's like predicting this middle pixel from a donut. And of course, the weights will not be uh, fixed weights, will be learned uh, by the network. But the input and the output are the same. So we're not in need of uh, clean, uh, noisy pairs. We are adapting this for our specific task of simultaneous shooting because we have seen that the noise is generally very much coherent in the time axis, very much incoherent in the X axis. So we are really doing, we are only used two rotations and allowing us to learn from the left and the right. This work was just submitted by my postdoc uh, Nick at the SCG. And the result that we are produced or we have produced so far is from another type of deep blending called continuous uh, deep blending or continuous simultaneous shooting, where you now have a single uh, source, but you fire it very, very fast. So you don't allow all the energy to come back from the subsurface because before you fire again, and you get overlaps between shots. Uh, what we simply do, we frame the problem as an inverse problem, and we uh, plug in these into the plug and play algorithm, and we use our denoiser of choice to denoise common receiver gathers. This is the results that we obtain. This is the sort of pseudo deblending 
that uh, can be obtained by simply applying the adjoint of the modeling operator to the data. This is what we obtain after our plug and play deblending. This is the true solution because this was uh, blended uh, numerically and the difference that is very small. And in the other domain, even more impressive, even though I must say that this is not the domain where you do the blending, but here you can clearly see the source has been separated. And once again, how does this compare to not including physics? For us, not including physics will mean we just apply pseudo deep blending and denoising, and to the best of our capabilities, we can get about 30% error. If we keep iterating and using this plug and play algorithm and also inform the problem with the blending operator, we can go down to less than 10% error. Finally, I'll go fairly quick here just to give you a flavor of how also physics informed neural networks can be used for processing uh, tasks, not just to modeling uh, PDEs. So this is a physics informed neural network. For those of you that have never heard of it, you can think of it as a normal neural network that takes as input independent variables of a PDE, produces as output the dependent variable at that location, and then computes the PDEs and tries to make sure that the network is able to learn to reproduce the PDE, so to make uh, the PDE go down to zero. And if you have some initial boundary condition, you can also add those. All of, all of this uh, is uh, trained in a self-supervised manner because you don't really have access to, again, input and output pairs, depending on whatever problem you want to solve. And you simply use classical backpropagation to update the network weights. So how does this fit into uh, seismic processing? Well, the idea here is from back in 1992, John Claire Bout suggested that seismic data can be very easily represented by superposition of local plane waves. And actually this is represented by the so-called local plane wave PDE. So the derivative of the wave field in the X direction plus the slope times the derivative in time direction should be zero. So if we want to now do interpolation, imagine we have some missing traces, we also have some observed data and we can think of those as being our boundary condition. So now probably looks a bit more natural why we want to use pins. We have a PDE, we have a boundary condition, and we can simply plug here the classical PD, uh, sorry, the classical pin architecture and make it uh, pin architecture for the problem of choice. So we can pass various points in the grid, try to satisfy the PDE, and also points in the different traces try to satisfy the boundary condition. And we need the slope. I'll explain in a minute how we get the slope. So we have two examples here. One is regular subsample data. How do we get the slopes? Simply using standard uh, signal processing, what we have been doing in geophysics for many years. We look at the area of the data that is unaliased, and in this area we can easily compute slopes using any algorithm of choice, PDWD in our case, but there are many others. We then inform the network about the slope, about the available traces, and about the PDE. And this is the result that we obtain, almost perfect reconstruction, apart from possibly the area where you have uh, some dips that start to be contrasting with each other and don't satisfy the actual uh, sort of uh, idea or the actual uh, uh, first uh, condition of this uh, plane wave uh, destructor uh, PDE. We have also a second example we find even more uh, fascinating. We take a data with a big gap. We then patch it into two data sets. We uh, learn the slopes and now we have slopes on the right and the left side. We have some uh, boundary condition, which is the data here and there. And we want to see if we can find something in the middle. And this ba is based on the idea that uh, neural networks are very good function approximators, universal function approximators. They can learn natural functions and possibly the simplest function which will match whatever loss function you have uh, selected for. So this is what we get. Uh, I'm not saying that for every problem we'll be able to reconstruct gaps. Imagine you had here a, a scatterer and a hyperbola here, you will not be able to reconstruct it because the network or any other algorithm will not know what's inside. But provided that you have some events that have continuity, the network has been very successful at reconstructing from the left and from the right, only being aware of the slope and the data itself on the either side. And this is what we obtain if we ignore the PDE. We just assume that we have traces. We tra uh, train the network to learn what's here, what's here, and then we ask the network to predict in the middle. So you can clearly see once again, if you ignore physics, 
your network will possibly not be as good as if you uh, help it with physics. This brings me to the conclusion. I think uh, in our group, we are fond and uh, we are having fun with neural networks. We think they are a great way to approximate functions. We think that alone they hardly can be the law of physics. So the sort of suggestion uh, that I always have for my students is uh, to think about how we can combine the two worlds together instead of trying to compete each other. We have tried to uh, show three possible applications. I'm sure there are more where without input and output uh, pairs, we are still able to leverage the power of neural networks and uh, in some cases it beat uh, state of the art algorithms. I just want to say a few words about the tool set. This is a library that myself and colleagues have been developing for a few years in Python for large scale inverse problems. And it turned out to be also very useful now because we can integrate it and couple it very nicely with PyTorch. So we don't need to spend time like other people are probably doing, redeveloping physical based modeling operator in PyTorch. We just use our modeling operators. We use PyTorch for the neural network part and we uh, solve the problems that I've shown today. With this, I'd like just to say that uh, if anyone here is uh, after a PhD or a postdoc or a master degree, uh, KAUST is a great place. Uh, on the right, you see what Saudi Arabia has to offer beyond uh, KAUST. Uh, it's a very nice and I would say new place for everyone, given that uh, up until a few years ago, you could not even come as a tourist. And it has uh, quite some great geology and also quite some great scenery. And more often than not, uh, also sport events are coming to Saudi Arabia now. And with this, I'd just like to thank everyone and leave a few websites and my email in case you want to reach out.